Welcome back to the Strength and Speed Podcast. I'm your host, Strength and Speed owner and Conquer the Grown Lip Pro, Evan Preparis. I've got a special guest with me on the line. Before we get to her, though, a quick word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Hammer Nutrition. If you're into endurance racing, which is what we're going to talk about for a lot of this episode, you're going to want to fuel with Hammer Nutrition, right? They're, they're perpetuum carb liquid, a carb fat protein brand blend is all liquid. That's what I primarily fuel with during ultra endurance. And it's easy to digest, gives you everything you need, and you actually don't get hungry. They've also got a full kind of lifestyle series of products. So things like REM caps uh, helps promote deep sleep, especially useful when you're doing overnight races or uh, getting ready for a 24-hour OCR, which again, we're going to talk about a lot during this episode. And they also have other things, uh, premium insurance caps, basically daily multivitamins and some other great products to help fuel your endurance. Uh, I would also check out the latest issue of Endurance News because I'm in there. I think I'm in a advertisement for Heed in there. So you can check that over at the Hammer Nutrition uh, knowledge portion of their website. And I'm also in the product usage manual, uh, again, from OCR America too, both those pictures. And then I'm actually going to be in the next, uh, I think, Endurance News too, because they just sent me like a preview of the page they're going to publish. So check them out. The Endurance News magazine still got a lot of great information about them. And the uh, product usage manual is very helpful because it'll actually tell you what should be used for what, or you can just shoot me a message on Facebook and I'll answer. And then if you're going to order, use referral number 240887 and it'll give you 15% off your first order. And it only works in the first order, so preferably go big. All right, let's get to today's guest. So today joining me, I have Rachel Waters. Rachel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so we're going to give a quick rundown of her bio. Then we're going to talk about some of her training history she recently won a 24-hour OCR called Casa de Garcia. And then at the end of the episode, we're going to talk about the 24-hour OCR I did uh, this past weekend. So both smaller events, but because World's Toughest Mudder wasn't happening, I think some other uh, brands and people jumped on the 24-hour OCR bandwagon. And I'm kind of glad because it was two very unique experiences. So let's learn a little bit more about Rachel. From Atlanta, Georgia, started obstacle course racing in 2015. Absolutely loves the sport. Some of her notable accomplish, accomplishments, she's got 10 plus podiums in various distance Spartan races, so sprint, super, beast, ultra distance, so wide range there. Got a second place in <coughs> Savage this past weekend, actually, while I was doing my race. She got a first place at the 15K in US OCR Championships in 2017 in her age group, third place in the 15K and 3K at OCR World Championships in 2018 in her age group. and. Uh, Top of podium finishes and other notable races, including, you know, she's kind of run the, runs a little bit of everything, right? So Tough Mudder, Bone Frog, Terrain Race, Battle Frog, Green Beret Challenge, Rugged Maniac, Barbarian Challenge, Conquer the and more. A little bit of everything. And uh, last year, she was fifth place pro at 2019 World's Toughest Mudder with 70 miles. And like I mentioned in the beginning of her bio, Juan Casa Garcia, 24-hour enduro with 80 miles uh, as the top overall finisher, right? Not just the top female. That's yeah correct. yep yeah and then other than that top 10 finisher in dallas high rocks pro female division currently ranked 15th on the deck of strong global leaderboard for women yeah, and other than that when she's not training enjoys traveling hiking spending time with her dogs and writing currently pursuing a spartan sgx certification and uh she's also part of our strength and speed uh development team although she stays pretty quiet in that group so Rachel, yeah <laughs> rachel welcome yeah the, the group's Thank been you. Sorry, the group's been a little bit lower key this year because of the lack of racing. So I haven't really been posting yeah. much workouts. Um, but I you know, watch. I watch, watch whatever, all the cool stuff everybody's doing still <laughs> this year, which is awesome. But uh, thanks for the bio. It sounds like a lot, but I guess I've been racing for, you know, about five years now. So start to, you know. Yeah, it starts adding up. Have a different experience, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, I think people in general do race for two or three years and then lose interest or give up and uh you know i'm a big fan of persistence and consistency and you obviously have that and you've been you've been doing well and uh not giving up so that's awesome yeah, to see it's too fun to not give up i think <laughs> so let, let's learn a little bit more about you and how you got into obstacle course racing before we talk about your kind of your current accomplishments so you know how did you find obstacle course racing you know what did you do you play sports in high school stuff like that yeah, that's, um, that's a cool question because 
um, I'd love to explain to, you know, people that I didn't play sports growing up. I didn't come from a sports family. I was outdoorsy. I had a brother and sister and we always played in the woods and ran around outside because that's what you did. But um, I walked onto the track team in high school and it was a really hard thing to do because I was bottom of the barrel. I mean, I couldn't run, you know, a hundred meters. Uh, the yeah, first day welcome of practice, to the club. Welcome you know, to the club. I mean, I, I embarrassed, but you know, the cool thing about, um, about high school track is it's one of the teams where they really can't kick you off. You know, if you just <laughs> show up to practice, you, you're in the D heat in the back of the four by 400 at the end of the meet, but, but you get to run um, if you buy, buy a jersey and show up to practice. So um, my, I think it was my sophomore year of high school, yeah, I just showed up and um, got a bonehead idea to do cross country the next year. And a 5K felt like an eternity, but I did it. And so I started running. Um, I went to Georgia State. I didn't run in college or anything, but I just ran as an adult. Um, it was kind of my, my therapy in my 20s. And then I was mostly road running, got into trail running, and then met a friend at a trail race who mentioned a Spartan race and said, hey, there's, you know, there happens to be one in like a month. And it was um, a Spartan sprint in Atlanta. And I didn't really know, you know, what I was getting myself into, but went out there and, and got my butt kicked. You know, I was covered in rope burns. And I mean, this was when you started in a water pit with climbing the rope. And, you know, I didn't even know how to use my feet or anything. And um, I loved it though. And then just instantly started doing them and just have, haven't stopped. So Nice. Think, and <laughs> did you jump into the elite heat right away or did you kind of find your way? Well, there? I did. I did my um, sprint in an open, and then when I was driving home, you know, the, on, on Athlinks, it was, so, it was always incredible how fast it is. Um, you know, the results are live, and I ended up getting in the top 10 of, like, 1,500 open women, and I was like, whoa, you know, um, I, I did well, so I then went and did a Savage race. Um, they, Savage came the next month, and so I just ran pro. And then I just never not run pro since then because I was like, well, why not? You know, and then I, I, you know, hung in there, I guess, in Savage Race and just again, then Battle Frog came and I was like, okay, well, I'll do that. You know, no point not running pro. Everybody will be in my way if I try to go later, you know, so I'll just stick with it. And yeah, so first race was open and then I said, forget it, you know, <laughs> all these people are clogging the obstacles. <laughs> Nice. And now you've, I mentioned in your bio, you've been making a pretty good splash on the endurance scene in the last couple of years. Uh, when did you transition from short course to endurance or did you, were you doing endurance from the beginning and we just, uh, I just didn't notice? Um, no, I had run, so before I even did my first Spartan sprint, I had run a 50k trail race before. So in my trail running, I had done some longer stuff, like not a lot, but I had done one or two um, trail 50ks. So I did have that background. Um, and so I've been doing Spartan. I did my first Spartan Ultra. I went out to Breckenridge in like August of 2017. Um, and since then, I've done like two or three of those a year. Um, those are kind of hard to get to because they're all in beautiful, wonderful places. But, you know, you've really got to fly from Atlanta. Um, so I, I do about two, two or three Spartan Ultras a year. And then when that World's Toughest Mudder came to Atlanta, I was like, well, obviously, you know, I live here. <laughs> um, you know, I, I got so lucky um, to have that here. So I guess I, I did my first ultra distance in, uh, in August, 2017. And then I've just kind of sprinkled them in, I guess, um, in it. And I love it. It's my favorite uh, distance to do, I would say. Gotcha. Now between, you know, we've also mentioned you doing well in some of the, in high rocks. So you know, you're doing well in ultra, you're doing well in ultra, you're doing well in high rocks, which is a lot shorter and a lot more strength based. You know, what is your, what does your training schedule look like for an average week? I guess it, it's changed. And, and I think that's, um, you know, one of the great things about staying with the sport for more than the, the hard, you know, two or three years, you really start to learn yourself and, you know, you develop and you can, you can change. So I think, um, you know, I've just, I kind of change every year. This year I, I signed up for high rock. So I was like, okay, well, I need to get a little stronger. Um, so I would say right now, um, it would probably surprise you to know that I only run about a hundred miles a month. Um, and you know, that, that was what I did leading up to my, my 80 miles. 
but I would do about 100 miles a month. I do um, yoga every week. I swim every week. And then I do at least probably five or six um, like CrossFit type of, you know, more functional strength workouts. You know, I've really gotten this year into stuff like dumbbell snatching and ball cleaning. And, you know, I think, I think High Rocks brought that out in me. Um, but it's really a balance and, and having to find that balance um, has taken several years for me, I think. But yeah, it's, it's everything, you know, you run, you swim, you bike, you stretch yeah. and you, you get stronger. I mean, that's still a lot of aerobic training when you add in swimming and, yeah. you know, the, if you're doing CrossFit or high rocks type workouts, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're performing at an elevated heart rate. Um, yeah. And my, you know, I, I just had to learn myself. I just can't handle some of the same running volume um, that other women do, but on the same way, I guess I have a, a different foundation. So, you know, just because some folks need to run certain mileage volume doesn't mean that I have to, but it's taken me a while to, to find that balance, um, to be able to, you know, run enough to, to maintain the cardio and the endurance that I need for, to show up on a race day and be able to, to get through it. But then also not just running so much that I can't do the other, the other activities or, you know, be injured. Yeah, no, that's good advice. And, um, you know, definitely knowing your strengths and weaknesses and your training background and adjusting accordingly is definitely some good advice there. And, you know, I, on top of that, I'd say, if you're doing these CrossFit workouts and then you're running in addition, you're essentially running on tired legs, right? So you're simulating mm -hmm. some of yep. that endurance training because your legs are not, they're exhausted from doing something else. So, um, yeah. it's like, it's like, it's like doing the second half, you know, even let's say you run 10 miles. It's like doing the second half of the 10 mile run. You yeah. Know? You know, I so. found what I love is waking up in the morning and running a couple of miles and then, you know, doing my work day or whatever, and then doing, you know, 15 to 20 minutes of, of an AMRAP um, with some, some dumbbells and sandbags and stuff like that kind of combination. That's it. That's a good way to, to spread out my week. Just to give an example of what, I mean, anybody could do it. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. What's your uh, day job? I, I, I need to ask in the bio. It's so boring. I work in HR. <laughs> oh, okay. You know? Yeah. I'm not like Batman or anything. <laughs> during the day. I, you know, I work in payroll and benefits and stuff. Gotcha. I feel like, you know, so, I feel like sometimes if you're in the fitness industry, it's less of an advantage because you're always surrounded by it. So it's less of an escape uh, versus if you're just sitting behind a desk, a lot of the times, you know, that's good recovery time and time to sit there. And then you're, yeah, but you're outdoor they time. They get to hang out in a gym and work out all day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, maybe I'm, sp I'm speaking from a point of ignorance here, but I know <laughs> my friends who have owned gyms are like, yeah, you'd think yeah. you'd be like motivated and excited no. all the time, but you're just burnt out because you're surrounded by it all the time and you're like yeah i'll just yeah. work out a little bit later i'll just work out yeah i like it. I, I like, like having this the distance and kind of the balance of having a job that's you know doesn't touch it at all you know gotcha but i noticed you yeah you know, like i said in your bio you're going for that spartan sgx certification how's that going um i've actually like not, barely started you know it's kind of my i just signed up so that's kind of a first quarter goal because i've got three months to get it done just you know, something to do um, in my kind of downtime, just to learn more, um, maybe for myself to help other people. Um, just curious to see, because it's really one of the only products on the market as far as, you know, an obstacle race company putting out any sort of certification. So just thought it'd be an interesting thing to thing to do because, you know, it's part of the, the sport that I love. So just wanted to check it out. Gotcha. Cool. Mm -hmm. Now let's jump into the 24 hour race that I mentioned in the bio. So Casa, Casa Garcia, Casa de Garcia. What am I? It's Casa Garcia. Oh, just Casa Garcia. I added a day. Mm -hmm. That's okay. <laughs> so tell, tell us about, well, wait, before we get to this, uh, we had to clear the air with something because I'm mad at you because you're, if you're doing a 24 hour OCR, you're supposed to tell Evan, everyone, all the listeners are supposed to tell me. So I'm tracking it. And I wasn't tracking this until after you won. And then I was like, are you oh, serious? Okay. So I'm, sorry. Uh, I'm a little bit mad at you. We're going to put that behind of, us. It was a very small event. Gotcha. So yeah, sorry. jump in. I'll do it next time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I, I'm a little legit. I'm not sure I've been able to make it anyway, but. No, because then you would have came and you would have ran more than 80 miles. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. All right. So tell us how you found it and, you know, what, a little bit about it and you know, course length and obstacles, et cetera, all the good stuff. 
Sure. So um, the Casa Garcia is one of those homegrown OCR facilities. Um, so my friends, Melissa and Danny Garcia, um, they're very active in the Southeast OCR groups. They're awesome people. They've been running for years. Melissa actually just ran a hundred miler this year. Um, so she's, you know, she's awesome. Um, and they, they built this place on their property and they really, they built it so that they could hang out with their friends and, and train. And so it's set up in their backyard and they're in Fayetteville, Tennessee. Um, it was a couple of hours from Atlanta and their property is, I think, about seven acres, and they have a mile and a quarter loop that's cut into their land. And the obstacles are spread out along that mile and a quarter. And the format of the race was interesting because we had 24 hours. Um, one thing that I loved is that the very first hour and the very last hour were just running. So it's really 22 hours where you're doing your obstacles, but it was sandwiched between these, um, you know, just these hours of running. And I, I'm sure you can understand that, you know, about hour 21, all you can do is look forward to that last hour, you know, when you didn't have to, um, you know, do some of the really, really tough stuff in the morning. Um, so anyway, that was kind of the structure. And if we want to talk about the different obstacles they had, they have about 25 or 30 obstacles spread out on the loop. So it's not, you know, one field of obstacles and then you run a, a bare loop. They're actually pretty well distributed. Um, the structure of their race was they had obstacles open for two hour segments and they would have five obstacles on the loop open for two hours. So you would do as many loops in that two hours with, you know, those five. And then, you know, two hours would switch to a different five. Um, and the reason that they did this was that it would make, you know, four loops would be about five miles and you'd have 20 obstacles. And so every five yeah. miles you had, you know, that was a, a reasonable enough number yeah. Um, yeah. kind of there. So it was, it was really neat because you also didn't know, you know, what, what was coming down the pipeline. So they had a whiteboard in the transition area that had, this is, you know, from these two hours, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., you do these five. And then towards the end of that, maybe with a 15 minute warning, you'd find out what your next two hours was. Um, so it was very organized in that approach. And, and it did give us the variety of all of the obstacles, but then not, you know, just doing the same, you know, gauntlet of obstacles over and over. Um, does that make sense? It's, I know it's complicated. I'm trying to explain it articulately. It, it makes perfect sense to me. And I think it's very okay. ingenious way uh, mm -hmm. without that much land to still give you that same ultra OCR yeah. feeling and also make it, it, it breaks up the race because now yeah. you're looking at the race in two hour segments as opposed to being like, I have 18 hours left now, 17 now, so, you know, you're, yep. you're breaking it up into segments and you know, the, there are certain obstacles that you'll in any, every ultra OCR, right? Well, you'll just hit muscle failure and you, you just won't be able to do them. So I think, yeah, you know, doing in, a little bit night, of each, there's, you know, yeah. there's some that are like more or less dangerous and, um, Part of it, too, was when I talk through the obstacles they have, you'll soon realize that you can't have people doing a pegboard for 24 hours because people can't do a pegboard. Right. You, you might be able to, like, but, you know, your racers, there's certain obstacle difficulty that your racers just cannot get through um, or maybe shouldn't do it at, at night or if it starts raining or whatever. But um, they had a huge variety of obstacles. So, um lots of different carries. So we had sled drags, we had farmers carry, we had multiple different things that you would have to awkwardly, you know, put on your shoulder. There was the heaviest Atlas ball that I, you know, I heard men like grunting on theirs. Luckily I had a women's weight. Um, I kind of felt bad when they were grunting on theirs. Uh, they had a tire that the men were saying was worse than the, the Spartan tire, but um, they had tire flip. Um, they, their rig setup was genius as well. Um, if you go out there, but they had at least five different types of rigs. Um, they had ones that were rings. They had this um, one that remind, reminded me, I guess, of the way that you would have wood hanging like on a tip of a spear sort of with your fingernails that you had to go across. And they had um, twirly bird types of hangings and um, again, a, a pegboard and floating steps. So they had a lot of grip, um, rope climb, stairway to heaven. Um, I mentioned pegboard, cargo net. Um, gosh. I, I, I'm trying to remember all of them now, but I mean, just a huge variety. Uh, they had a spear throw as well, um, an Irish table, um, 
the tires that you are across, I don't even know what it's called. I know they always have them in OCRWC. I think they come from Bone Frog, but it's like these tires that spin and you have to jump over them. Um, yeah. Uh, what I is that? Roll, it's, it's I hard. Say rolling Thunder or something. Yes, and it's a lot harder than it looks. Um, yeah, because if you if you don't if you don't commit, <laughs> you essentially go onto the tires and fall right yeah. back. Yeah, it's embarrassing. Yes. So um, yeah, they had a, a big variety of obstacles, and then they did. Um, you know, again, five obstacles at a time, and they did do penalties um, because it, in a 24-hour race, you kind of have to, I think. I mean, we can talk more about yeah. the structure of yours and your opinion on that, but um, you could certainly try something as, other than the spear throw as many times as you wanted to if you could do it, um, but then they had a penalty wheel, so you didn't even know what penalty you were getting, and it was, you know, sort of like a wheel of fortune wheel, and on that wheel, it was the luck of what you got. Um, you know, so, and sometimes that could be 25 burpees. Um, it would be like, you know, weird, these terrible combination of push-ups and dips. Um, but then, you know, in the middle of the night, there was a free spin on there. I never landed that. I always got like burpees and jump lunges and stuff. <laughs> but, you know, you could, you, you would spin a penalty wheel. Um, and then they did end up at two or three different points giving like one free bead bracelet away like if you did something so i um ended up having you know three bracelets where i could not do a penalty um and that was really kind of the setup of how they did it um it was pretty organized um and then when they were done it was incredible they sent us this massive spreadsheet full of all of the laps that we did and how many penalties we did and what our completion rates were it was really really interesting data to look at um so that was kind of cool you you probably would like to look at it because it's just kind of neat to see um, see that. But yeah, that, that was the setup and we were able to set up tents um, and crew. So there was a nice transition area with an aid station and um, we just ran our loops as many as you could. Awesome. I mean, it sounds like a great event. Um, I really like these smaller events sometimes just because they're, oh, yeah. they're unique the energy. and you know, you end up you end up knowing every single person at the event and their pit crews and you kind of become close. And then on top of that, there's there's no I'm gonna say this, it's gonna sound it might sound bad, but there's no rules and there's no common sense check, right? Like Tough Mudder is and Spartan are a big corp they're big corporations. Well now they're one corporation, right? So they have rules and um, you know, policies that they have to adhere to. When you go to some of these smaller events, it's just like Hey, I'm the owner and this is what I'm feeling and this is what we're doing. And you're like, all right, you know, I, okay. <laughs> so I, I like that, it, you know, it prevents, it gives you like a, a, a feeling of the unknown, right? Cause like you go into tough mud or you go into Spartan and you generally know what the obstacle is going to be, you know, at world's toughest, they typically debut a couple of new ones, but you know, you know, 15 of the 20 obstacles. When you go into some of these smaller ones, it is, you know, like you said, you know, there's a pegboard in, the, in a 24 hour OCR, right? Which is like pretty much unheard of so yeah it, and it's just the smaller experience is special because even if you don't know somebody before you got there by the time you go through that together you know you're you did and and with people's pit crews too and it sort of you know it, you get that feeling it's a, it's a lot more special I think when you when you have that smaller group and less pressure um, definitely a lot a lot more laid back than yeah. some of the bigger more intense you know, races where everyone's there and there's people and, you know, obstacle media groups and stuff. I mean, this is just, you know, quiet, quiet and, and laid back. So. so tell me about the bibs. Cause I know they had bibs made and I think they had some pretty nice awards. So. Yeah, they um, went above and beyond. They got bibs um, printed with the, they have a really cool um, like skeleton kind of day of the dead logo yeah, i love it and, i love it yeah yeah they got these really cool bibs made for us and then we were able to get our names printed on them too which was really nice and so that just added like a really extra special thing because you know as you know those bibs are really special um because they're that thing that you get to hang on to and remind you of what you did that weekend um and melissa is a great artist so she you know she did those i think she may have one of the machines where she can screen print or something. I'm not sure because she did a great job. So, I mean, we were all just like falling all over ourselves for those things. Um, and then she made some really cool handcrafted wood engraved awards for the finishers. So it was 
um, you know, you really felt like you were getting a special kind of unique award. So I, they did a great job with them. But yeah, those bibs were, were great. I love it. Cool. Yeah. And uh, check the Strength and Speed Facebook page after this publishes and we'll make sure we get some of those pictures up or it'll be in the yeah. podcast uh, photo. So definitely check that out. Cool. Now comparing it to World's Toughest Mudder, you know, give me some, you know, maybe lessons learned or uh, some comparison points for those who've done both. You've done Atlanta the two years, correct? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yep, I have not. Lo- I'm hoping to maybe go to Vegas, but yep, just Atlanta. Yes. Um, yeah, go. Different, you know, um, different and uncomfortable each in their own way. Um, I would say that world's toughest mutter was more physically uncomfortable because you know i didn't they didn't have water obstacles at you know the the casa garcia so um no wetsuit which is a really big um level of discomfort when you're going for anyone that's ever done 20 you know of the 24 hours you end up in that thing at least 20 hours at least in atlanta you do um and you know i think that that was a big thing i would say world's toughest mutter was a little bit more physically uncomfortable um, but you know, the one thing I've always not liked about world's toughest mutter, and it's hard for me to say, I don't like it because I love the race is that you can help each other through obstacles. And I think that that's a great bit of camaraderie. And I believe that in our sport, we should help each other through if you're in an open wave, or if you're somebody that's, you know, needing assistance through it. But I have a hard time understanding having pro athletes out and and able to have help and receive help and give help. So that was always one thing, at least when I looked at it from, you know, more of a pro racing perspective, one of my, you know, things I didn't like about competing in the world's toughest mudder because it's not really as level of of a playing field, I guess, Um, where, you know, this other one was set up in a way where it was just you and you had to do the obstacles yourself. Um, and so I thought it was a better measure of somebody's ability to actually do obstacles um, in addition to the running. I mean, certainly there are penalties and, and such. So you do penalty out, but it was more of like a singular performance instead of, you know, having different people out with different levels of help, I guess, on the course. Um, but, it, you know, they're, they're really different. I think, um, again, I would say World's Toughest Mudder is a little bit more physically uncomfortable because they really put it on you with that mud and the water and that can really break you down, I think, mentally. Um, you know, my past weekend with the Casa Garcia, the weather was nice. You know, the temperatures were good. It really wasn't, you know, very uncomfortable physically. So that can really make a difference when you're talking about 24 hours of performance. Um, but I just, again, I just think they're hard to compare because the, op- because the obstacles are so different, I guess. Um, Tough Mudder throws the mud and water on you, but you know, having to do some of these Irish tables and um, inverted walls and stuff in the middle of the night by yourself is um, just a different ball game, I guess. Yeah, that's an interesting point about the, you know, helping each other at obstacles. And, you know, I think some, some people may be like, well, how is that unfair? And it's like, well, you know, you never know who's at the obstacle to help you. And then if you're more well known, I think, people were going to help you more or they will be nicer to you. Right. Like, well, and are you helping other people? Also you that's know, true. Right. Cause yeah, cause you, you know, can, you like, can blow by it and just ignore everyone yeah, else. So, and you know, and that's not, I'm not like trying to start any like, drama about, you know, who, who, who may or may not get help, but it's more just if you're trying to gauge actual like athletic performances against each other, you know, it's kind of, it's just hard because it's, you know, you kind of have to have clear rules sometimes yeah um with obstacle completion just because um you know they're so vague sometimes that yeah but um anyway i don't know if that answers your question that was yeah so and tough mutter is really vague about some of their rules like it yeah spartan spartan's pretty uh detailed on their rule book but if you look at the tough mutter rules it's basically like get across the obstacle you're like yeah um so i actually wrote an article on mud run guide called um what is it called the spirit of the rules or something like that. And it basically it goes through, um, and specifically I use a bunch of examples from World's Toughest because at the end of World's Toughest last year, there was some complete shenanigans going on with people like, you know, you, you remember the gauntlet obstacle with like, it's like rings and there's like hang from your fingertips. And then there's yep. like, a, uh, at World's Toughest, I think last year, or was it Toughest? I can't remember. I saw someone walking across the side like it was a balance beam. 
Wow. And I was like, what? I was like, I, yeah, that's not even close to what we were supposed to do. And it's like, oh, yeah. come on. It's like, come on, dude, you know better than that. And then, you know, there was other people like, yeah, I just climb I like use the top of the structure. And it's like, again, man, like that's not it's clearly not what you're supposed to grab on the, on the structure. Well, I think the problem too, is that Tough Mudder itself used to be used to have competitive waves like back in the day but then it really migrated more into like a team building type of ocr if you go out to most tough mudder races out in the country i'm not talking about endurance i'm talking about just a you know a tough mudder the intent is that you can't do it yourself right so their obstacles really are built in this way and i think that's great because you get people out there that you know help each other and, and work as a team and maybe grow as friends grow as families encourage each other and, and that's you know what one of the things i love about obstacle racing but it doesn't always mesh. Those types of obstacles aren't always going to mesh for a leader pro competition because, you know, if it, it physically is built in a way that takes two people, then you can't do it yourself. You know, it's not the athlete's fault. But anyway, I mean, I didn't want to not to open that can of worms too bad, but I've just always thought that about that race. But, you know, what, what are you going to do? Um, I just enjoy it. So I'm like, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting points of view. Um, yeah. Cool. So let's, Talk a little bit more about your, your, your strategy and your fueling and stuff like sure. that. So um, any, let's talk about your fueling and then go through some of the gear, any sort of specific uh, training gear you use to help, help you perform. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I've had to learn and, you know, you probably know this too, a lot of nutrition is trial and error. And, um, you know, as you, as you run different things, it's important to, you know, try what you're going to eat not on race day, you know, just because other people post a picture of what, you know, they ran their race with doesn't mean that that's what's going to make you feel good uh, when you're on course. So I just want to kind of throw that out there as advice, you know, when you're trying to plan for something like this, um, you know, do your research, but try it before you go um, and see and see how, how your body reacts. Um, but when I do these types of races, I try to consume the most real types of foods that I can. Um, you know, my strategy with fueling is to constantly be sipping fluid, you know, even before I'm thirsty, you know, I, I was, I had a hydration pack on my back the whole time, um, even though the weather was good and, you know, most of the other runners weren't carrying anything because in their mind, it's a mile and a quarter. That's plenty to be without water. Um, but for me, you know, those laps were taking, you know, my average was, 18 or 19 minutes so you know it gave me an opportunity to take that sip 10 minutes in um, because if you do it a little bit at a time um, you, you're constantly keeping your body going before it's you know too late um, if, you, if you don't keep up with that so I had my hydration pack on I put the perpetuum in there I learned that from you thank you yeah from reading yeah I read your your ultra book and um and I ordered it offline and, and I liked it and so um, I really use that in my hydration pack. I, I water mine down a little bit more um, than, than what they have, but I love it. It's easy on my stomach. So I was sipping that in my pack the whole time, just little sips. Um, and then I just really try to every, every hour about at least eat. Um, and I made a list of what I ate and it sounds like such random stuff, you know, but it's really trying to avoid strict sugar, um, not trying to eat just gels and um, gummies and, and trying to, you know, run off of that. It's really about putting, you know, whole foods into your stomach that can actually fuel your body because it takes a lot of power to go over obstacles. And if you're not putting that in, it's not coming out. Um, so I really stuck with things like chicken noodle soup, um, peanut butter and jelly. I actually drank my chicken noodle soup cold out of the can because the weather was, you know, warm enough to where I didn't even need it. Um, we had chicken noodle soup, peanut butter and jellies. Um, I had a little bit of Coke every now and then and ginger ale, you know, bananas, um, a little bit of coffee in the morning. Um, my main fuel at night, and this is almost funny, you know, the things you learn out on course, they had made these pot stickers. So they were like frozen dumplings from Super Walmart or something. And they had those in the middle of the night with like a dipping sauce. I ended up eating at least 10 of those. I know that's like completely random, but um, you know, I didn't plan on eating pot stickers, but they were there. And um, so 10 pot stickers fueled me, um, but grilled cheese. Um, I also ate some kind bars 
and then I had I love dill pickle chips so dill ch pickle chips for salt and then some banana bread you know just I know none of that's mind-blowing food but it's just you know regular food that my body would be eating on a normal basis mostly and then in the last three to four hours when I just couldn't take it anymore, um, I then had to move down to basically caffeine. You know, that was when I was like, I cannot put any more, um, you know, snacks in my mouth. And so for those last three hours, I ended up having um, a cup of coffee and I had two or three gels because that's all I could, you know, tolerate then. And so I kind of ran the last bit on that steam. Um, but leading up to that, it was really a consistent flow of those types of, you know, snacking foods with perpetuum and, and water. Gotcha. A lot of great advice there. You know, the constant drip of fuel into your body. Yeah. The, um, you know, using Sorry, perpetuum. I talk a lot. <laughs> no, that's good. And then, you know, you, you, just listening to your foods, you know, you mentioned stuff that is a mix of, you know, fat, carbs, and protein. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, which is good because you're making sure you're, you cover all those pathways. And then the other thing I really liked you said was, you know, waiting on caffeine towards the end, right? Because yeah. everyone starts out too fast as it is. Like, there's no need to pour oh, yeah. caffeine into the problem. So, oh yeah, but you know, and I'm a, I'm a coffee drinker. Um, so, you know, one of the volunteers had her thermos of coffee and she poured, you know, she had just walked out with it and she had it fresh and she poured me a cup of coffee. And I swear that was the best coffee I'd ever had in my life. I was like, this is so good. It was, you know, we start, oh, we started at noon on Saturday and went to noon on Sunday. So, you know, this is eight, maybe eight in the morning when I've still got those, you know, four hours left and that cup of hot cup of coffee was, you know, a game changer, but yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you've had this experience as well, but, you know, you do get to that point at the end where it's almost too late. There's no point in even putting food in. And that's why I kind of, yeah. you know, I, I know that's a simple way to say it, but um, it, at that point, you know, once you've hit that 20, 22 hours, um, it really doesn't make sense to be putting heavy food because your body can't break it down fast enough by the time you finish. And so that's, again, when I start to switch to things like a gummy or a gel, because those can be very hard on your stomach, at least for me, and, and they can make you crash. So um, that, but that is my kind of primary fuel source is running on the steam, I guess, of the end. <laughs> yeah, good advice. Any specific recommendations you had for <laughs> shoes or anti-chafing or anything like that? that you? Anti uh, I do have the best anti-chafing. Um, it's called Bag Balm, B-A-G-B-A-L-M. Um, it's from Vermont. It's used for guys that work on cow farms and their hands get chapped. It comes in this green tin. Um, I've learned about it. Yeah, it's, um, I've, you know, two world's toughest mutters and this one, I've never had a blister. Um, you know, it's great, but it's bag bomb is, is your winner. It's, it's really cool. You should pick some up. It's, you can get on Amazon or they've got a website. Um, that's the best, the best chafing. I wore Hoka's uh, when I ran. So I wore Hoka Torrance for this one. Um, you know, I think with shoe, I, I prefer Innovate for anything that's going to be maybe a Spartan Beast or less. I like the X Talons because of their grip. Um, but then, you know, anything above that, I kind of mix to, to a Hoka because usually you're not going to have the, the need for the lugs on something kind of slower. Right. Um, so that's my shoe choice. And then I'm a mixed bag with clothes. I'm whatever I can, you know, find on sale is, is what I like. So nice. <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to, I want to get into my 24 hour race. I want to, I'm so excited. I wanted to do that, but I, I went to Savage. So I'm really excited to hear. I want to hear about the format and how it went and the obstacles. So, so be before we get to that though, give me a quick rundown of Savage. Cause I know you had a really good weekend and uh, how that played out. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was fantastic. You know, it was about three weekends after this 80 miles. And I was like, oh, you know, I've still been just not feeling it, it takes some time to kind of to kind of fully come back from that. But I was kind of in my head about it. I went up there. I'm like, forget it. You know, I'll regret it if I don't. Um, so I went up there and my legs still felt tired. I was in like sixth or seventh place, but everybody was losing their mind about this rig that was on there. You know, everyone was talking about it before. And um and I just, they had posted it on their Instagram story the day before when they were out there, you know, building or whatever, hyping people up. And I kind of looked at it and I was like, yeah, well, that's hard. But you know what, you know, Rachel, you can do that. Like, don't worry about it. Um, and so I'm running and, you know, keeping my head down. I'm in like sixth or seventh place because I don't run fast, 
you know, like some of the girls do at the beginning. I'm kind of, I'm more, you know, I, I start out and then I got to the rig and um, Tiffany Palmer had gotten through, but then there were like five girls or so just there. And I was like, okay, you know, this is what I thought it would be. And um, they also had a gauntlet set up because they had it literally in a row. It was wheel world, rig, sawtooth, um, anchors away, inversion therapy, then battering birds. So it was like six or seven, like really grip intensive in a row. So I knew that like that was going to really mess with people because, you know, you fall off a one into this cold water, you may still have to get through three or four more. So anyway, I got to the rig and I just kind of got on it. And um, I don't know if you've seen a picture of it, but it had this weird flimsy piece on that was really hard to grab. And I think that what got people was that you couldn't just swing through this thing. Is it, um, was, you had, was it the horizontal cheese board thing? Yes. Yes. It was that Swiss cheese looking thing. Yeah. And it like bends like as you grab it, the whole thing, like, because it's like thin fiberglass or something. Anyway, you have to have the grip strength to be able to literally hang there long enough to like, look at it and be like, what do I do and mess up? And then like, so I got across the rig and I got second place doing that. And, you know, there was a, not another girl for like 13 or 14 minutes behind me. Um, it just the obstacles got everybody. So it was just set up great for me. Cause I guess, um, I'm not the fastest, but. I have pretty good obstacle strength. So it was my day. It, it felt good. That was a good way to end the year. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, oh, thanks. you can't, you can't win or you can't podium if you don't show up. So you yeah. Know, yeah. I did, this, I did the same thing. Lesson. Yeah. I did the same thing last year. I did two races after world's toughest mutter uh, within a month and I, oh, I, wow. didn't, I didn't train at all. And I came in first. One of them was a warrior rush endurance race. I came in first in that. And I did tougher mutter uh, Florida and came in second in that. Um, and I felt like complete, I felt like complete garbage the entire time, but, Yeah, you know, but I, <laughs> yeah, I, I felt a little garbagey this weekend, but you know what? It, it worked out. So. And, and I, I really lucked out on tough mud work because there was something like three races going on within like three hours of each other. So I think it spread out the normal competition. So I, uh, yeah. Oh, don't talk down. No, that's well, not it. it. I'm you not, I'm not talking anyway. that. That's a smart move. I, I'm, I wish I, <laughs> I wish I would have known that going in. So I, I could have uh, said it Slow was like a, little bit. a logical decision. Like I, oh, I'm yeah. doing this because there's several races going on, but it was blind luck. Um, but I yeah. found out that weekend and I was like, Oh, that means, that means people are all over the place. And, but um, you still ran those miles though. You can't take that away from me. That's you. true. My heart rate felt so high anyway. So t tell me about Arkansas. Cause I want, I, I wanted to go. So I'm really excited to hear about that. Yeah, so the one of the guys in the world's toughest mutter, uh, Charles Tank, I'm, I'm not yep. going to pr pronounce his last name, um, but he was planning on running uh, world's toughest. Obviously, it turned into virtual world's toughest. And um, before, around in May, his wife actually died unexpectedly um, after like 20 years of marriage. So uh, heartbreaking there. And he wanted to dedicate uh, toughest world's toughest mutter to her, but because there's no world's toughest and he works on an oil rig. He, he, he couldn't do virtual world toughest. So he's like, I'm going to create my own uh, 24 hour OCR. So it's called Kimberly's 24 hour ultra mutter. And he put out an open invite to the entire world's toughest mutter community. And a couple people responded and said they were going to come. And um, I decided to come down after I, my virtual world toughest was a complete bust. So um, I'm kind of glad it kind of fell apart there because now, then I was like, Oh, I'm definitely going to this. Yeah. And basically he set up uh, five miles on his property. Um, and he, he only has like, he said he had three acres, but so the course, um, the course had so many switchbacks. I'm thinking, I mean like probably a hundred switchbacks. Like it was. Oh, wow. You Mine cover, had some switchbacks too, but that sounds like switchback hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you covered almost every square inch of his property. Um, <laughs> so, which is hey. really important. It was impressive. It. <laughs> yeah. I, so it was kind of a, it was a mind game because sometimes you'd be like, okay, there's mm -hmm. the next obstacle. And then you would literally zigzag through this field and for like 10 minutes before you got to the obstacle, it's like, I can literally see it. I can, you know, if yeah. I cut the course, I could be there in 30 seconds. Especially at night with your, your headlamp on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so you dedicated the race to her. The coolest part um, for me was so you know, it's on his property, but adjacent to his property is, is the church. I'm assuming the church he attends and the cemetery where his wife is buried. So actually at the start of every lap, we ran on the road and we ran by his wife's grave, which I thought was oh, wow. really That's touching. Special. 
Um, so, you know, you know, he was stopping there and talking to her pretty much at every, every lap. Um, you know, I, when, when it was empty, I would go over and, you know, uh, basically say hi and, and keep running, but it was, it was just a really nice touch. And then, you know, the, he built all the obstacles himself with the help of his friends. And, uh, so see, we had, uh, a very long Tyrolean traverse made up of several ratchet traps. That was pretty hard, actually. Uh, there was a uh, three-section uh, pipes balance beam type thing. These, oh, these wow. plas- those okay. plastic uh, pipes usually you crawl through, but you had to walk on top, which is because they're that's not that's not easy. No, and they, they're not they weren't like per- secure. They were uh, yeah. uh, essentially a wire running through them, so they moved a little bit. So you had to be careful. Um, there's a high wire, low wire traverse. There was a sandbag carry. There was a couple of low crawls, a couple of uh, kind of uh, railroad ties you climbed over. Uh, there was a spear throw. There was an incline wall. Um, and the, the incline wall actually went into a goat pen. And you actually did like almost a spiral through the goat pen. And there Were are, there, there goats in the Yes, there was pen. goats in there. <laughs> And so he's like, he's like, yeah, Killer and then you go, savage goats. He's like, and then you go into the goat pen, and I'm like, well, yeah, like I'm from New York, like I don't hang around goats. Uh, but he's like, yeah, they're friendly, don't worry. And I was like, okay. And, goats are um, pretty cool. Yeah, they're cute. They only get they only got in my way once when I was trying to get out, and uh, like we kind of, you know, I moved left and right, and he kind of moved left and right, and then he went left and I went right, and we went around each other. So it was no big deal. But they were confused why. Uh, there was all the idiots running through their pen, you know, every hour. Yeah. So, um, then the I'd say the other hard or challenging obstacle was it was a um, stump. So right, like maybe like six or seven stumps in a row, and you had to jump from stump to stump. And I got up into the first one, and I look at the second one, and I'm like, "Are you effing kidding me?" <laughs> I was like, "It was pretty far." So yeah. I'll, uh, there's a t- we did a Technique Tuesday video for it for Conquer the Gauntlet Pro Team, so that'll go up probably in a week or two. And uh, I'll post a picture to my Instagram, so if you want to go back to Ultra OCR Man Instagram, you can see what it looks like. But it, I mean, I I had to leap. I was, uh, yeah. It, okay. It, it, it was kind of uh, mentally challenging. And then he had, what else? Uh, vertical cargo net that was unsecure at the bottom. Um, I had so some weights. for something like the stumps, if you fell off of one, did you have to go back to the beginning? Yeah, I mean, six. he. There wasn't really too many clear rules. He was basically like, "Do the best you can," and okay. um, you know, I basically, if I fell off, I'd got, I'd go back and try it again. So, yeah. um, that's what I did. Um, I'm not sure what everyone else is doing, to be honest with you. Uh, again, similar, similarly, there wasn't that many people at the event. Yeah. And um, but it was, it was such a good atmosphere. Um, you know, both running for someone, a memorial of someone, and then two. Um, you know, the, the way they had it set up, you ran by the pit. Uh, let's see, mm-hmm. you started the pit and then ran by once, twice, three, like three or four times per lap. So you, the, like the pit crew got to see you and they had a bonfire going and people were hanging out drinking hot cocoa. Or- That's great. Yeah. Especially when your pit gets to have that camaraderie, because, you know, when you look at world's toughest mutter, they're kind of stuck it in one spot and you're, you can be out there. If you slow down, you can be gone for an hour and a half, two hours or so yeah. you know, in the middle of the night. And, um, but here it was very similar in the way the course was set up where, you know, you're kind of looping back around. And so, you know, people that aren't your pit crew are cheering for you, you know, and we I actually, I knew some of the people that were up in, in Arkansas, you had a great group of people. Yeah. Over yeah. There. I saw Joey was there. I think yep. they were pitting him. Joey yeah, McGlam- the- McGlamory. Yep. I think yeah, uh, who mm-hmm. used to be used to do a lot of races with Blind Pete as his guide. Some of you may know, remember him from yeah. that. Yeah, he does the more heart than scars group. I think. Yep. And so that yeah. you know, speaking of that, they they again, I'm expecting like I'm like I don't even know if I consider this a race because like I'm just showing up to this guy's house and running some miles. But like, I mean, they had they had bibs just like you know your event with like the name of the race on it and the more mm-hmm. heart than scars logo on the back. Um, so they. So they racer bibs they had pit crew bibs and then you know like a couple days before the event he's like i got trophies for the top five and i was like he's serious <laughs> so i was like cool so um, i saw they were big trophies huge yeah it's the biggest trophy i physically own <laughs> like it, it is large um so yeah so uh it went well and um we, we just had a really good time you know running through the course the uh so i'd say 75 percent of the course was in like this lower field 
and it had rained, I guess, pretty bad over the last two weeks. And it was, I guess at one point the field was flooded and uh, he had actually dug out some drainage ditches, but my feet were wet. Your feet got wet like every 50 meters, right? When running through the field. (laughs) Um, And it got cold. Like it dropped down to like thirties at night. So, um, you know, I'm running and I'm like, man, my feet are cold. Like, you know, like, why am I being so like, why am I being such a pussy? Cause like, you know, my feet are cold, but like <laughs> my, you know, my, I'm still running in shorts, but my, my actual yeah. toes are, you know, and then I'm like, and then it dawned on me, like at world's toughest motor, you get wet, but then you come out and you're typically running on dry, uh, land for a while before you go into the next water obstacle. Right. So there's, you know, your feet get wet. I don't know. Five to 12 times per lap, let's say, uh, yeah. depending on the year. But then it's typically dry in between. Um, here, yeah, you also have a bigger loop, you know? Yeah. Here it was like every, you know, every couple of steps was like slosh, slosh. And then you're like, <laughs> so, you know, I thought I, I thought I was being weak, um, but we're, we're recording this Wednesday night and like my toe tips are still numb. So maybe I wasn't being weak. Um, no, I mean, cold, it, it's so interesting on these, you know, with 24 hours because, I mean, taking out the, the physical things you have to do. You know, it's hard enough to, to have to do that, but it's like, y- you get just physically uncomfortable and, and, and all of the different races bring something different to them. Cause if it's hot, you know, you're hot. If it's cold, you're cold. If you're in a wetsuit, you're like constricted feeling, or, um, you know, if you're, if it's so hot that you can't wear long sleeves, well, now you're going to rip up your arms on, you know, the obstacles that you do over and over again. And so they just all present their own challenges, but, um, wet feet is definitely not a fun thing to have for 24 hours. So wet, cold feet does, does not make you a pussy. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> that's, that I, that's tough. Cause you know, when your toes, your skin on your toes can only be wet for so long before they start to get really uncomfortable when, you know, you can have problems. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Very good points. And then uh, other than that, there was a rope climb which with a very thin rope, which was uh, pretty challenging. I, it only took me like, two poles to get up but uh the last lap i did i actually failed it because my it was just that the rope was just so thin <laughs> and then a spear throw if I, if I didn't mention that already but yeah fun event and it was uh it was a much better way to end the year and like you said the the group out there was just amazing so yeah i think we're both really really fortunate because i had big dreams for this year i was stoked to see that the ultra uh championship for spartan was going to be in killington and i mean that i was so excited <laughs> i was that i was going to go do that and then i wanted to go to dallas maybe and do you know world's toughest mudder again and then you know our everything got canceled and so i think we probably are both feeling the same way about the fact that we got to do 24-hour races is pretty special this year um and you, you really appreciated it more because um they just didn't happen um, so I think we got, we both got pretty lucky to get to try some different ones. And um, I'm hoping that it encourages more people to start to make them because there really aren't a lot of options for OCR endurance events. And yeah. so it's kind of, it's kind of neat to see them popping up. Um, do you know if Battle Frog is going to bring BFX back? I never did one. So I, I didn't listen to the latest news, but I heard okay. the first Battle Frog event was not going to have BFX. And then it was, they, was, okay. they were planning on bringing it. Maybe. They were going to bring it back at a later point, like basically get their bread, make sure their bread and butter is good. <laughs> make sure the first event works out well yeah. enough and then, you know, worry about, about the multi-lap. Okay. Yeah, it, it, was, it was neat. If you want to do Battle Frog, I would go as soon as possible. Um, just my, my, my gut feeling about how long, um, you know, I, I don't think it's the best business move to start a, what essentially is a new race series um, because, you, you know, there's a several year gap since the last one. Um, right after a pandemic or in the middle of a pandemic, I guess we're still in the middle of it, but yeah, my, um, I'm not even going to make it to that floor, like my schedule for, for the year, I've already started to look at stuff. And so I'll just wait. I, if they come to Atlanta, um, you know, I'll, I'll check it out, but who who knows, who knows what we're going to be able to do next year. So I'm trying to build a schedule, but also be prepared for, um, you know, changes to that. And also looking to see maybe some more 24 hour events can, can pop up in the yeah. future and some of these homegrown ones. Cause it was a lot of fun. I know, um, when world Toughest mother was originally going to get canceled because tough mother went out of business, Hubie Cushman from Indian mother on is like, Hey, if I do a, 
24 hour race, the weekend of world's toughest is, will people come? And I was like, hell yeah. I was like, I actually almost hope world stuff doesn't come back. Cause I, I kind of want to do that instead. But uh, yeah. So, and yeah, then, I've not oh, done Indian mud run. I want to so bad at yeah. like, has it, I think this year I was going to, and then I like finally was going to commit to it. And then, you know, it didn't happen. <laughs> so maybe next year. Yeah. I and mean, most of the 24 hour OCRs in the U S are no longer occurring, right? Shell Hill, closed which is with a permanent obstacle course up in vermont uh dirt runners midwest mayhem 24 hour uh they're no longer at that vent that permanent venue so that, that's not going on terrain race did that one 24 hour relay so that's not going on um so essentially there's world stuff is mutter uh there is there was supposed to be spartan ultra beast world championship at killington this year and uh platinum rig is supposed to do a solo and relay version um, last year and, and this year, last year obviously didn't happen, but uh, then other than that, there's, you know, these two little local ones that kind of popped up. So, yeah, well, hopefully more. I mean, I also love, again, I love the Spartan ultra distance. I know it's not the, the same, but it does give a, a good enough suffering for me. To, <laughs> it, 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 it scratches the suffering itch, you know, enough, um, <laughs> to, to, you know, and I, I like a lot of those because they're beautiful venues, yeah. um, you know, aspen and killington's beautiful in tahoe and so um i really enjoyed you know doing that distance um but you know i've i've actually seen they're starting to add a few more of those too so um at least the the availability of you know 30 mile races is seems to be increasing too but again we who knows what's actually gonna be able to to be, happen next year and these events that are listed may not may not materialize so we'll just have to wait it out yep Yep, we'll do what we can. And if, yeah. you're, if you're not, tra if anyone's not tracking, Conquer the Gauntlet is only doing one uh, big event next year. So instead of the you know couple spread out throughout the Midwest, they're essentially doing one in Oklahoma. And it is, I think, first weekend in September. It will be a, a barbecue Friday night, elite race, and open race Saturday, and then a team race on Sunday. And I know the team race only has a limited number of slots. I think it's like 20 team slots. So if you want to go to that, uh, I would get signed up. Oh, and, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. And, you know, Conquer the Gauntlet put on five races in 2020. So, I mean, there's no worry. I would not even worry about it being canceled, right? Like, that, that's happening. It's, uh, it's 100% happening. That I put money yeah, on I, it. You guys came to Atlanta one time, and then you, you never came back. It was, yeah, it, was so, it was devastating, you know? You needed more people. Not enough people showed up. I know. But Mid Midwest is kind of far, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And that was a good, uh, if anyone listening, the Atlanta race was the one with the warped wall uh, that they oh, yeah. found yeah. in the woods, mm -hmm. essentially, from a previous race and rebuilt that it. That was getting everybody at the end, and the spinning monkey bars, too. Oh, yeah. So my, the cover of my uh, autobiography, that's the, it's the pictures from CTG Atlanta, of me going up the warped wall. So. Okay. Yeah, that was fun. But again, you guys came once, and I loved it, and then you never came back. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, maybe I'll check out September. Take a trip out to Oklahoma. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It'll be it'll be worth it. It will be worth the trip. I can I can get. It'll be worth with, the trip to Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, especially with you know, with only one event. I mean, like. Yeah, getting to do a couple. Going. Yeah. Well, everyone's and if there's like a team out. race, yeah, if there's a team, like you know, you get to make a whole weekend out of the travel as opposed to, you know, let me fly across, you know, fly for hours, you know, for a one shorter race. Yeah, for know, a five k kind of, OCR. And yeah. Then, Pack jump up. back on a plane and come home and yeah. your weekend's gone yeah all right so let's start wrapping it up and since we're on, we're on the podcast here and we got a guest tell us something people would be surprised to know about you and i will try to match it or make it somewhat relevant or go oh completely gosh off topic. <laughs> yeah it's um oh my gosh well i guess i'd be surprised to know that um my car is like really embarrassingly dirty inside and i never vacuum it <laughs> is that pretty good <laughs> ah, that's okay i guess is your house is your house dirty too is your house dirty um, too? or then you're just a no, dirty person or no my car is just like uh, abnormally like i just like i run and they're in it and stuff so my my car is really dirty i'm a like an organized and smart person but i just for some reason can't clean out my car so you know I, I don't know. So, so I'm so uncool. Um, 
yeah, so it was something exciting about you that nobody would guess so, other than, you know, my dirty car. I feel like I've used both of the car ones I had already. Well, I mean, this is a good one because it'll probably make anyone laugh that hears it. Um, I did actually one time drive away from the gas station with the gas pump still in my car. That's And I drove it. I drove it all the way back to my office and then I parked at work to go back into the building and it was like dangling from the outside of my car. So <laughs> that's for <pretty> cool. <laughs> you return it or were you just like, I'm this is too embarrassing to go back no, and I brought, I brought, I brought, oh, that's nice of you. I, I feel like most people would just <laughs> would have just been like, I can't go back there and face that guy. I didn't know if they had a video camera with like going to get my life, you know, the FBI n knocks on my door at home or something. I don't know. <laughs> that, but yeah, I, that was a pretty good one. I just had to share that because I actually did that. I have the picture somewhere too. I'll have to post it on my story so people can see that I, I did do that. It's pretty embarrassing. So the, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've used both these. Um, okay. But if you read my autobiography, uh, yeah, I talk about at least one of these in there. Well, um, the most expensive car I've ever been near or been like physically touching is uh, they found King Faisal's car in Iraq when I was there in 2008. So it was like a 1930s Rolls Royce Phantom. So there's a picture of me in front of it. And it was, I mean, they said ISIS, they said not, it wasn't ISIS. They said Al Qaeda had captured it uh, during the initial invasion and the Iraqi army had captured it back. And we actually went uh, to the Iraqi army compound to take a look at it and take pictures. And then I don't know what happened to it. I think so what I would something like that be worth? <sighs> like if, if it was even like for sale, I guess. <laughs> I mean, a 1930s Rolls Royce Phantom has got to yeah. I mean, that, that's got to be like a million. And then it, the fact that it's King it's Faisal, yeah. uh, the first rule of Iraq, you know, from Lawrence of Arabia, that's got to be worth like another million, I would assume or something. Was I, that like the prettiest car you'd ever seen? Yeah, I mean, was, I, I've seen... That's the prettiest car I've ever seen on the street or like out in, in public. Um, okay. if, you, if you go to, you know, if anyone who's assuming they do it again in um, UAE, but if you go to Spartan World Championships in the United Arab Emirates, I mean, there you'll see Maseratis and uh, Rolls Royce and, um, you know, all, all the fancy cars, all the cars that are six digit Aston Martins, right? They'll, they'll just be zipping up and down the street all the time. So you'll see a lot of those out in public. Kuwait is the same way. I mean, there's just, it's just like supercar mania, right? You just, uh, you just see it everywhere. Um, and the, the most expensive car, I, I, I've been in two really expensive cars that I've been driven around. And one was um, one of my partner forces in Kuwait with the lieutenant had an Aston Martin uh, DB5. So I rode in his car. Uh, he took us on a sweet, man, I'm going to call it mandate. He, like, we, all, we all went out to the movies and then grab some grab some coffee that afterwards sounds really sweet <laughs> <laughs> i mean he was, he was driving an aston martin so i was yeah you're impressed. like i don't care what we do i'm, I'm just gonna <laughs> ride around you know? um and then i the most expensive car i've ever driven was a mercedes e-class um up armored with like all the bells and whistles so it had like night vision on it and uh oh, wow. also like it was pretty much like a, a james bond car it was it was pretty awesome um, well, and, and like heavy nobody armor lets too. me drive expensive cars because I would just, you know, trash them with dirt. So <laughs> <laughs> and I can't have nice things. <laughs> all the, all this is through military, through the work with, through my work. Right. So it's not like, okay. I'm not, a, I'm not even a big car person. Like usually someone has to tell me to be impressed for me to be impressed with the car. Um, but you know, like I said, if you go to Kuwait or UAE, you'll see that, I mean, you'll just see Maseratis and all sorts of crazy cars. Then you're like, Oh, I recognize yeah. that this is a several hundred thousand dollar car. But. Yeah, well, it's there's a lot of money in it, you know. And then there's some some of us other people that you know run run in people's yards for twenty four hours, you know. So <laughs> I guess everybody right. has their thing. <laughs> That's right. I drove my last car uh, for like fifteen, sixteen years before it finally uh, shit the bed there. So what kind of car was it? Uh, Subaru Impreza. Yeah. I love, I had an old Outback. Actually, it was the car that, you know, pulled the, the thing, but I've got a Honda now. <laughs> it's a great pulling power. I can rip a... It has some fantastic <laughs> gas, you know, <laughs> gas pulling power. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. All okay. right. We're going to get going because it's kind of late and yeah. I go to bed early. So yeah, uh, it's before, past my bedtime too. <laughs> before we get going, any shout outs you want to give friends, family, sponsors, and or where can people find you? Social media. 
Um, yeah, well, I want to give a shout out to Casa Garcia OCR so you can look them up, um, show them some love, check out their videos if you want to see some of the stuff that, you know, I did at my 24 hour race. They've got great videos there. Um, and then you can find me on Instagram. I'm um, Rachel underscore fit underscore girl. Um, or you can just look, look me up on my name, Rachel Waters, and, and you should be able to find me there. Um, but yeah, just thanks for having me. Um, really enjoyed hearing more about that race and, you know, getting to sort of talk with somebody that speaks the same language that I do and has the same idea of fun as me because um, it's, it's not for everybody. Right. Um, and the other funny part is, you know, I get surrounded by people like you and other people in the ultra OCR community. So like my scale of normal and what's acceptable uh, is, mm -hmm. is skewed. Right. So I'd come back <laughs> yeah. from the race and I'd be like, oh, I only ran, you know, X number of miles. And they'd be like, Oh my goodness. And I'd be like, yeah, you know, I mean, that's not that far. And they're like, no, that's really far. And you're like, yeah. Yeah. It's like, I go to work and they're like, I'm sorry, what you ran 80 miles. Yeah. Like they, just, like they just don't even understand. I'm like, yeah, but it's fine. Like it's, you know, it's fine. Like, it's, just, yeah. it's just my, yeah, it's normal to me. <laughs> so any of our listeners, uh, again, we have bleg in the strength and speed online store, uh, extreme small, medium and large, and then lights. I think we are we're either very close to being out or, or, or completely out of large lights and small lights. Um, there might be a couple left in stock by the time this airs. And then medium, we still got a decent number. So I know the shipping has been a little bit delayed because of Christmas. So I am still putting them in the mail within 24 hours of ordering. But some of the shipping, instead of taking like three days, is taking a little bit closer to like seven. So just make sure you order with plenty of time for Christmas for those of you who want to do that. And other than that, I got some articles coming out on Mud Run Guide. Make sure you check those out. One of them is a review of Kimberly's 24-hour ultra mudder. And then there's also a review of, uh, or it's a talking about Lion Hearts. It's a youth OCR group uh, based out of northern Georgia slash um, Chatt near Chattanooga that uh, helps kids train and run OCR for free. So you're going to want to check that out. And then other than that, I started converting some of my – training books to audiobooks. So you can, you can pick up Ultra OCR Man on Audible, um, writ, uh, read or narrated by a professional, or, and or, you can, um, on Podbean, if you look up Conquering the Gauntlet, you can listen to the Conquer the Gauntlet book um, through Podbean. So it's, it's a premium channel, so essentially you have to pay for the book, uh, the audiobook on that. I've also done... Uh, so right now, there's only one audiobook on the Podbean. There's, there's also a channel, uh, besides Conquering the Gauntlet, it's called Strength and Speed Premium, right? So Strength and Speed Premium channel, as I record uh, the, this audiobook and the next two I'm going to put up on, or three I'm going to put up on that channel, the price of the premium is going to go up. So essentially, you can pay now. I think it's $16, and you'll get access to it's just $16 one-time fee. And you get access to that audiobook and then the next three that I put out on that channel um, for $16 now. Or you can wait and, you know, every time I release a book on that channel, the price is going to jump. So essentially, if you invest early, you get all the good stuff uh, for the lowest price. If you wait until they're all out and available, then you'll pay probably four times the, the price to get all that audio content. So you can check that out. Uh, it's my way of uh, raising money for the podcast and covering some costs rather than doing um doing some other methods so yeah that's that's it that's all i got uh rachel thanks again for coming on it's good talking to you and uh like you said enjoy the always enjoy the good ultra endurance talk awesome well thanks so much for having me and enjoy the rest of your year yep you too okay